Good morning, members of the media, community members, and allies. On behalf of the people and all the campaigns affiliated with today's unveiling of the people's budget, I want to thank you all for joining us outside of City Hall, or thank you for tuning in if you are watching via live stream. My name is Mac Harris, M-A-C-H-A-R-R-I-S, and I'll be the MC for today's press conference. A little bit about myself, I'm a spoken word artist, and I have been for about five years now. I'm also a community organizer with the Long Beach, and I've also been doing that for about four years now. I am a youth ambassador with the Long Beach Investing Youth Campaign that's been going on since my senior year of high school, back to 2017. And before we get started, I would like to let you know that speakers and representatives from the campaign will be available for interviews after all the speakers have concluded. In addition, we have press packets with all the information available for members of the media. If you need a press packet, please see James Plaza with Long Beach Forward in the crowd. He's wearing a pink shirt. He's over there making his hand. <laughs> Today, we also, everyone here, stand united in Black Lives Matter. So to, to, to solidify this, I would like to invite us all into just a moment of silence for all the lives lost. I would also like to invite all of you now in just a moment of breath. That moment of silence was just to give honor to all the lives lost and to honor my people because we're being targeted, y'all, and it's not okay. For the past two years, the People's Budget Campaign has forced conversations and action for equity and justice in the Long Beach City budget. Because Black, Latinx, Cambodian, Filipino, White, and other members of the community came together, Long Beach started reversing historic patterns of divesting communities of color. Today, we are at a critical juncture, juncture in our city, city, city's history and our nation's history. Amid a global pandemic and uprising, we are all bearing witness once again to systemic oppression driven by racism, capitalism, and white supremacy. Well, it is, whether it is police criminalizing, committing direct violence on black bodies, or greedy developers gentrifying our neighborhoods and displacing our neighbors, our communities have had enough. Now is the time for bold change that puts black lives at the center and reduces harm in every way. Prioritize the communities first, invest in real es essential services, and reimagine community safety. As multicultural and multigenerational alliance, as a multicultural cultural, and multigenerational alliance, we are calling on Mayor Robert Garcia and all nine city council members and city manager Tom Mokadia to adult to adopt the People's Budget Fiscal Year 2020. Black Lives Matter and all our communities cannot wait any longer. Your funding the police is not just about shrinking their budget. It is about shifting resources to community solutions and that create safety, education, housing, housing, parks, and mental health. Safety safeguarded by violence is not actual safety. We must re-envision and build a new city that, but that city budget that prioritizes black lives and communities of color. And that starts today. Yeah. The people's budget specifically calls for two strategies. First, divest from the local from the Long Beach Police Department. We call on, mayor, on the mayor, city council, and city manager to fund the Long Beach Police Department to end their pattern of, targeted, of targeting low-income communities of color and criminalizing property. Policing is not the answer to our schools and communities' most pressing needs, including jobs, housing, homelessness, health, and immigration. We must divest. When we divest from police, we redirect resources so that black, indigenous, and people of color can live successful lives. The second strategy is to, invest, is to invest in black lives and communities of color. We call on the mayor, city council, and city manager to reallocate funds and direct additional resources on an ongoing basis to community-led priorities that create health, opportunity, community, and justice. These community-led priorities consist of the following. One, reimagine community safety without police terror and grounded in restorative justice and black empowerment. Decision makers should invest in black unific family unification, community-led crisis response, violence reduction, and prevention strategies that are outside of the police. Provide reparations to, to black and or African American people from the war on drugs, from the war on drugs era, and to victims and their families of racial profiling and police violence. Prioritize families directly impacted by the war on drugs in all social economic opportunities, especially in the equitable ownership of cultivation and distribution in the cannabis industry. 
Invest in community-led restoration events to support stronger connections among neighbors. Two, affordable, support, affordable and supportive housing. Establish a, a dedicated source of funding for supportive housing with wraparound supportive services for residents experiencing or on the brink of homelessness. Three, right to counsel for all renters. Establish a right to counsel to, award le to, to provide legal resources and re representation to renters in need regardless of immigration status. Effectively reducing evictions, preventing homelessness, preserving affordable housing, and stabilizing communities. Four, citywide rental housing division. Establish a rental housing division within the Development Service Services Department to communicate with both tenants and landlords. Issue legal bulletins and updates enforcing renters' protection laws. Centralize information and forms, and administer a citywide right to council to a council program for renters. Five, community health council. Establish funding for neighborhood-based community health council to implement community-led crisis, crisis response for mental health, safety, and well-being emergencies. Six, job training. Prioritize free job training and job opportunities for black residents, regardless of their background and education level. Provide city, the city's project labor agreement by requiring, an, by requiring an independent jobs coordinator, redefining who qualifies at a, as a disadvantaged worker, and adding penalties for non-compliance so that black residents actually benefit from these union jobs subsidized by the city. Seven, language access. Dedicate ad adequate staff to implement the city's language access policy lack in full consistency throughout the city and fully create a culture of language, of language justice. Permanently move inter interpretation and translation services in-house to provide faster and higher quality interpretation and translation. Provide Spanish and Khmer interpretation without advance request at all city council and charter commission meetings. Provide community-based organizations who work with limited English proficiency for the residents ongoing stipends to conduct outreach about the policy. Eight, senior and youth programming. Increase funding for senior, for senior and youth development programs and supportive services through community-based organizations. Community centers, public libraries, and parks in historically disaffected neighborhoods. Initiate the implementation, implementation of the AIRP Livable Cities Initiative that the city committed to over two years ago and has yet to implement. Nine, universal legal representation for immigrants. Renew and increase funding to the Long Beach Justice Fund to provide free, uni free universal legal representation to immigrant immigrant res residents facing deportation regardless of their background. Collectively, these demands make up, make up the budget for fiscal year 2021. To discuss the, bu the people's budget further, please welcome Don Mockins with Black Lives Matter Long Beach. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? We're on the freedom side, so you all will respond. We're on the freedom side, okay? Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? On the freedom side. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? On the freedom side. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? On the freedom side. Thank you. Um, so this morning, um, I just thank you, um, just first to our entire city who has been holding, who has been holding down and throwing down with Black Lives Matter, our Long Beach chapter over the, not only these past couple of weeks, but for the last six years in this city. So I want to offer just a clap up to everyone. Woo! Here, for folks who are watching at home, we know that this work 
takes a village. Um, and so we just wanna, I just wanna, on behalf of our Long Beach chapter, express appreciation for the love and courage and support that everyone's been pouring in. Um, for the last six years, for the last seven years, we know our global movement uh, since George Zimmerman got off from, from killing Trayvon Martin, we have been calling for accountability over police. We've been calling for the end of uh, murdering black lives. So we also know that this isn't the first iteration of black freedom struggle. We know that we stand on the shoulders of ancestors who came before us uh, in liberation and freedom work. This is just the current iteration of that long struggle for black freedom. We know that this is spiritual work. And in this work, we seek to center our most marginalized communities, to center our most impacted communities. And so, I'm gonna share some very concrete demands around employment, around, account, around accountability, around housing and education. But before I do, I wanna invite two women who are here with us today um, to kind of remind us of why we're asking for at least two of these demands around community oversight over police accountability, not like the kind of ability we have with the Citizens Police Complaint Commission. Those are for complaints, and we know it's overseen by police and by the city attorney and by the city manager. We know that they block every effort to hold police accountable. We know that they block every effort to be transparent. So before I get into those details, just a reminder of why we're calling for that community oversight and why we're calling for care, not cops. So I want to introduce up uh, Corey Taft, the daughter of Frederick Taft, and she will, can share her story for herself. And then I want to uh, invite up Gada Murad, who is the sister of Faraz Murad, who will share her story herself. My name is Corey like, Taft. I am the daughter of Frederick Taft, Fred's only child. My dad was a 57-year-old man, a hardworking man, who loved being around family and friends. He also enjoyed spending time with his two grandchildren, he loved and, who were loved and adored their grandpa, grandfather. Sorry. On July 21st, um, at Pan America Park in the city of Long Beach, at the Pan America Park that sits in between Lakewood Village and the city of Long Beach. My father was there gathering with family and friends at like a family event. Uh, my father and uh, his sister, a woman friend, walked to the restroom. Um, my dad walked into that restroom, never walked out that restroom. She went into the woman's restroom and my dad was, is the restroom where, the, oh, sorry. The restroom is a stall and like two urinals. The stall was occupied, so my dad used, went to the urinal. As soon as she went into the woman's restroom, she heard gunshots. She immediately walked out. She seen a white male, older white male, walking out like a long rifle. And just immediately walked outside of the park. My father laid there. My, shot, my father was shot multiple times. Um, I wasn't there that well, nine times. Back, hip, head. And my father laid out. Um, the guy, unfortunately, he got away. I wasn't there that day, but I received a phone call, which I was down the street at, um, um, I was at my son's basketball game at the Lakewood YMCA. I immediately got there as soon as I could, and um, my father stayed in that bathroom. Um, Long Beach Police Department was there. They called for Lakewood Sheriff's Department, but because it wasn't their jurisdiction, they didn't come out. So it took Long Beach Police Department like nine, 10 minutes to get there. Um, my father wasn't covered. He laid in that restroom where, people, where his body was exposed. People, um, they didn't have the crime scene blocked off. Um, people walked in and out that restroom destroying evidence. Um, that no helicopters were deployed. Um, my father, um, they didn't cover him up. It took for the corners to come. The corners got there, roughly like around 12 o'clock. 
midnight or something like that to get my father. People were jogging in the area of the crime scene where they had a little part of the bathroom blocked off, but again, his body was completely exposed. Sorry. The Long Beach Police Department immediately destroyed the scene, and with the help of Black Lives Matters, we had to have our own community investigation because the department failed to investigate. In the investigation, we found they didn't investigate. Investigate, sorry. There are members of white supremacist organizations, lots of police and sheriff who lives in that neighborhood. And I would like to thank all of the residents and neighborhood around Pan America Park. Over 75 people came out to assist us. This is why we need more community oversight. I mean. We need community oversight over police accountability. There is a $30,000 reward out for my father. The uh, killer was never caught. All we know is that he is a white male. Um, I'm sure he probably lives in that neighborhood, but prior to that day before my father got killed um, at a bench that was far away from where they were, it was all kind of uh, messages on that bench, go home niggers, KKK, all kind of other different type of stuff that was on that bench. Um, the city came out the next day um, immediately painted over that bitch, which could have been used for evidence, but they didn't use it. They just immediately c covered it up. So, thank you guys for letting me share my story. Um, and again, I would like to let you guys know that there is a $30,000 reward out, and my father is Frederick Taft. Thank you. just got into many amazing universities, including UCLA, Berkeley, Irvine, and Long Beach, and many more. He was trying something. He was just a young man, just like every other 20-year-old. My brother was a nationally ranked debater, a brilliant young man with so much to offer. On the night of his murder, Officer Hernandez had the opportunity to help my brother with three firefighters and many other bystanders offering help and exclaiming that my brother was no harm. Officer Hernandez was a gun-happy man who shot my brother five times, two bullets in one hand, one in his heart and lower back, and one bullet in his other hand. My brother was explained to be very sloth-like and confused and, and harmless by bystanders. Hernandez was offered help multiple times by three firefighters. The firefighters wanted to help and handle the situation, but this cop wanted to kill somebody that night. Hernandez chose to use his gun when there were Three firefighters, three. How many others has this man killed? Has he killed someone else? Was he involved in other shootings? We need, these, we need to know these things. Why is this man in the streets? Why is this man who killed a young, young, young unarmed man still, still in the force? I want transparency. Does this man has, have a history of violence? I'm concerned about what this officer has done before. The, atten the intention of Senate Bill 1421 is to give us transparency and inform us about the history of police officers and their misconduct. This is limited by an article in the bill that Mayor Garcia placed, which allows for a few days for police, the police departments to know that this information is being requested and who it is being requested by. There shouldn't be any limitations on this bill. Lastly, we should be more focused on investing in community care. Why is a cop at the scene when someone is in a mental health crisis? Why can they handle Why can they handle a school shooter so delicately, but murder unarmed, helpless civilians? Why did cops get Dylan Roof a Burger King meal after shooting up a church in Charleston, but my unarmed brother gets shot five times? Why does every other person have have their records public, but cops don't? Hernandez took a young man's life for no reason. 
Hernandez was not held accountable. A jury decided he wasn't either. A district attorney decided the same. So I'm here to tell you something that is terribly wrong. We are tired, of, I'm, I'm here to tell you three things. We are tired of losing our siblings, our children, parents, friends. The system is flawed and we need to change it. Invest in people who can actually serve and protect. Firas meant a lot to me and so many others. He was a loving, kind, intelligent person who is missed every day. Losing Firas was a big loss for the world. Thank you. I want to invite us. Uh, thank you, Corey and um, Gada, for your courage, for your strength, for showing up in your fullest wit every day since the loss of your loved ones. Um, Long Beach has your back always. And I want to invite us to. Um, for the folks who are here and for folks who are watching at home, we invite you to do the same, to say their names. We're not only fighting, right, and holding space for the loved ones whose family members' names are in the national media, like Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, but we do this work to hold space for and support and change policies for family who have lost loved ones right here in Long Beach and to hold police accountable around these losses. So I invite you to say their names. Marcella Bird. Marcella Bird. Dante Jordan. Dante Jordan. Noel Aguilar. Noel Aguilar. Hector Morejon. Hector Morejon. Jason Conocenti. Jason Conocenti. Faraz Murad. Faraz Murad. Martin Hurtado. Martin Hurtado. Lionel Gibson. Lionel Gibson. Barry Prock. Barry Prock. Sin Juan Priam. Sin Juan Priam. Frederick Taft. Frederick Taft. Catherine Gomez. Catherine Gomez. Luis Ramirez. Luis Ramirez. Jordan Michael Griffin. Jordan Michael Griffin. Cezani Mount. Cezani Mount. And we do this work for them. And so I'm just going to read from some notes regarding some specific demands around accountability, education, housing, and health. The Long Beach Police Department consumes 48% or 249 million dollars of our city budget, and yet we're no better for it. First, there was shadow slavery, then penal colonies, followed by Jim Crow and the war on drugs made war on black communities. Here in Long Beach, the pattern of targeting low-income communities of color and criminalizing poverty creates tensions that boil over time and again into righteous uprisings. Policing is not the answer and the real need of our communities. We're calling for investment in black lives. We're calling for defense of black lives. Taxpayer dollars divested from the police must be invested into resources that improve black communities. This will require full transparency of the police budget and the scope of their assumed responsibilities. In recent decades, the Long Beach Police Department has gained responsibilities in education, employment, housing, social work, and in mental health. That is not their work. <laughs> I think, like, you know, we haven't put out an exact amount of dollars that we're expecting for these budgets to be cut, but just to name, like, a few dollar amounts, generally speaking, 10 million alone can be cut from the 2.6 million that they, uh, you know, are allocated for policing at Long Beach City College, the 1.6 million that is used to police Long Beach Transit, when Long Beach Transit has its own ambassador program, we can invest in 
resourcing that program and strengthening that program that is grounded in care and support, not with guns, right? And Metro, $5.4 million. I don't know how many of you know, but there are plans and intentions and desires the police department has to build an $11.2 million police academy. And that's just for the, administrating, the administrator building. That's just for the administration building of an $11.2 million proposed police academy. So we need to divest from those investments. Okay, here we go. Around education. Acknowledge the existence and impact of systemic racism in our school district. Our schools need culturally competent academic and socio-emotional counselors, nurses, non-carceral social workers and behavioral specialists, art and music, ethnic studies, physical education and after school programs and applied technology. We want the district to end their relationship and all contracts with the Long Beach Police Department, any of them, whether it's one or a hundred, and any contracts with school resource officers. End zero tolerance, hire more black teachers, professionals, and support staff. Yes. Around housing and houselessness. End the arrests and sweeps of houseless communities. The response to COVID-19 showed us that the city, the city leaders are actually capable of providing housing and services. Rent freeze and eviction moratoriums must remain in place throughout the pandemic. Rent control and affordable housing with wraparound and supportive services and unburden the black women who are the most rent burdened in this city. Yeah. Yeah. Around health, provide health, wellness and fitness resources for families impacted by envi environmental disparities provide improved health care for black mothers to be ending death during childbirth birth the high rates of death during childbirth i have a cousin who recently had a baby and she almost could have been one of those statistics um yeah i can't tell her story without her permission publicly but they had to um yeah it's personal um, resource, mental health services and programs. Around employment, significantly, significantly increase city contracts with minority owned, black owned businesses that employ black people and restore black economic infrastructure. Community led employment and development programs ensure all city project labor agreements prioritize recruitment and job training for black long beach residents we don't mean local hire as in bringing people in from north from orange county we mean local hire as in right here from long beach and the city and, and lastly accountability it's a little bit longer list so bear with me identify and resource departments and individuals to help root out the many forms of systemic and institutionalized racism and anti-blackness, including in the Long Beach Police Department. Incentivize that. Yeah. <laughs> See something, say something. <laughs> to use their own language. Actively participate in community-led budget processes for our city and our school budgets, like we are today. Engage, participate. Establish community-led civilian oversight, as Gada mentioned a moment ago, over police accountability so that it actually has and uses its subpoena power and oversight powers to discipline violent police and leaders up to and, in, and including prosecution. Reject any proposals to expand this police budget. Yes. yes. Require, yeah. Woo require police, not our city, to be liable for their misconduct and violent settlements and qualified immunity. We want a reduction in we want to end police corruption, which includes reduction of power of the Long Beach Police Officers Association. And if you got a police union, them, someone said. 
prohibit city candidates from taking money from police and their police yes. association. Yes. Give that money back, y'all. Stop being bullied by the TOA. Yes. Withhold pensions and don't rehire cops involved in use of excessive force. Yes. Yes. Make police association contract negotiations public. Yes. So that we don't have situations like we did in, two, in September of 2019, where the mayor, Garcia, took it upon himself to arrange backdoor deals to help the POA circumvent state law, Senate Bill 1421, calling for transparency. And instead, he helped them to further hide those, uh, to further hide uh, violent police and their records. to that, for sure. <laughs> Immediately fire police officers who have excessive force complaints. No hiring of new officers or replacement of retired, fired, or resigned officers. Yeah. Yeah. Cut funding for police relations. End all police contracts with social services, care services, and government agencies who provide care. I think, you know, I just hope, I'm gonna wrap here, I just hope that, that our local government is listening to the city. We don't need a reconciliation plan for you all to be responsive to what you've been hearing for the last six years alone, just right yes. here in Long Beach. Yes. Yes. Right, that we know is an attempt to try to draw out time. Um, we know that that co-optation and exploitation is real. We know that you will attempt to divide our communities. We know that you will attempt to, I don't know, pick people off to try to douse this fire, but it won't work. And um, I just, I encourage folks who work in our local systems and institutions, especially uh, black workers in our city to be bold, to be encouraged, to be your fullest, strongest black selves. Um, again, we just thank you to the rest of the city for your continued effort and energy in holding police accountable and to, and to defend black lives. Let's give her one more big round of applause. Next, please welcome Maria and Beto Lopez with Long Beach Residents Empowered. Beto. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, folks, my name is Maria. My name is Maria, and in a time of being bold and courageous, I say I'm undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic. I migrated to Long Beach at the age of three, and now I'm the director of community organizing for Housing Long Beach, and I organize with the Long Beach Tenants Union. We all have complex lives and all these issues are intersectional and we must agree 100% to that. This is why we're here. This is why it's the people's budget. And this is why all these issues are necessarily on this budget. We are all living intersectional lives. In 2008, um, I'm gonna share a personal story. In 2008, one year before I became the first high school graduate in my family, um, my brother was ripped apart from us due to a deportation. I'm a local resident here in the first district where I migrated to, and um, in the night, my brother went to the 76th, right here on Magnolia 7th, and never came back to us. 
and to his baby girl who had just been born. 10 years, over 10 years it's been, right? That our family has had to deal with this. He has not come back. We have lived in the same neighborhood and everybody that knew him was like, hey, where's Chino? Where's Carlos? And my mom always had to say he was ripped apart from us by LBPD. LBPD stereotyped him, arrested him. He was cleared through the justice system. This is the double penalized of communities, right? We go through this justice system and he was cleared. And once he was let go, he was let go to the, ICE, to the hands of ICE. So LBPD works with ICE. Say that. LBPD works with ICE. LBPD works with ICE. LBPD works with ICE. And LBPD also evicts families. Yes. Yep. Okay, I work in housing. Now I'm going to shift over to how this all connects. I have the privilege and the opportunity to organize in the community that I migrated to and that I was raised in, um, which is a really big privilege to be here today with all of you. I can say that colonialism and capitalism and all these other isms pushed me out of my land. But in 2018, to be 2019, Feb March 1st, 2019, I'm gonna tell you my story of my eviction. <laughs> capitalism, colonialism, and gentrification evicted me in March 1st, 2019 for asking my landlord to remove bed bugs from my first ever home apartment that I had worked hard as fuck for. In October 2018, I asked for repairs. I started getting bit, I couldn't sleep. It, it, was, it, it was affecting my job, my health. And so I said, with the most terrifying feeling in my heart, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give her the nicest letter, repair letter, even as an organizer, as educated with this information. I'm fucking scared to lose my home, to lose my stability, to lose my family. Okay, October 2018, I asked for removal of bed bugs for some minor repairs in my kitchen. And in that same month, I was faced with a 30 day notice to move out. I knew that I was not gonna leave quietly and I knew that in this job and in this struggle, it takes us learning opportunities, right? It sucks. And it might not have to be learning opportunities if housing was a human right. If community had ownership of land, right. community control of land, community control of housing, housing is a human right. 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 Not just for the rich and white. No. So I fought. I fought for five months long and strong. And uh, she didn't accept my rent, so I, I fought to keep it. Because I thought that was just. Okay? I hired an attorney here, local, Basta. I'm not going to say um, any comments about that. It was a struggle even then with power dynamics with attorneys. And I know you all know this. Okay, this is why, again, community ownership of housing. I fought, I went to court, I got a settlement. Five months, I didn't pay rent. I kept those five months. I lived there less than a year. She didn't give me my deposit back. Why? Well, the attorney didn't modify for it. Okay, fine. Um, I got 3,000 in relocation assistance, okay? At this time, we were already hearing locally about rental assistance. Nah, 3,000 don't do nothing for me. I need seven, eight, 10K. Right. A I don't got children, a family with children. How are they gonna move? How are they gonna move? You need childcare to move things? If you're in Alger, how are you gonna move your stuff? If you don't got a car, how are you gonna go somewhere? These are important things, and this is why housing needs to be a human right, it should be stable and it should be affordable. Right. So 
So that's a little bit about my settlement. Um, I didn't get, I, I filed, uh, so enough is enough, right? Even in these court systems, we don't really win. We only win when community really owns the land and the housing, okay? I want to be very clear about that. So I got an attorney and now I'm going to talk about right to counsel and why that's important, right? Because all these things that I supposedly win, right? We only win when we get the land and the housing, again. Um, I, I had an attorney, right? And they, it's known that 94% of cases that go to court without an attorney lose immediately. Um, and so, uh, this is why we this is why we fight for right to counsel right to everyone to have a counsel um, an attorney to provide legal resources representation to renters in need regardless of immigration status regardless of immigration status let me say that again yes. loud for the people in the back regardless of immigration status <laughs> immigrants are a big part of our community and a big part of the, the struggle for liberation. And so we must be clear. We must be clear on these demands for our, our housing, for our education, and for our liberation. And last but not least, I really want to say that right to counsel will effectively reduce eviction, prevent homelessness, preserve affordable housing, we want more affordable housing, and stabilize communities. I'm gonna leave you with this last chant, okay? I want you to take a look at this, but I'm gonna leave you with the last chant. And it goes, when tenants rise, cities thrive. When communities are stabilized, we have an opportunity to take back that power, to Think of bigger and better things for ourselves, for our loved ones, and for our communities in extension. So when sit, when tenants rise, cities thrive. thrive. When tenants rise, cities thrive. When tenants rise, cities thrive. Cities thrive. I'm gonna hand over the mic now to my colleague Beto. Woo. Hello everybody, my name is Beto, current project director at Libre, which is another housing organization here in the city of Long Beach. And just like Maria, I am also undocumented and unafraid and unapologetic. <laughs> and so what I'm here to talk about is, you know, we need a housing department here in the city of Long Beach, right? Somewhere where tenants can go. Somewhere where tenants don't have to look for the community organizations that are already overdoing the work for the city. We end up doing the work for the city because when they pass a policy that has no teeth, we have to enforce it. There's only so little organizers that can't do this, right? And the city should be able to fund a department that allows tenants to be able to negotiate with their, ten with their landlord, right? A place where tenants can go and complain about their landlord and not be afraid of being retaliated against. This is what we need today. Currently under a pandemic, we still have tenants being harassed. Right, showing up to their houses without 24 hour notice, showing up and saying, hey, we need to change your door. Hey, we need to paint your door. Hey, we need to change your windows. Exposing these families to what's going on right now. We're still in a public health crisis and there's nothing that tenants can do to protect themselves. Why? Inability and lack of policy from the council. And so we're asking that in the people's budget, we also include a housing department or a housing bureau where tenants can go and advocate for themselves but also a place where, ten, where the city can pass policies and have an enforcement mechanism that allows tenants to defend themselves. Like Maria said, right, if you don't have an attorney, 94% of those cases, you end up losing. In 2018, there was rent strikes all over the city of Long Beach. How many of those rent strikes were successful? Many of them. Why? Because of people fought, but still they were displaced from their homes. A lot of the first district residents that fought and were on those rent strikes are now living in the north side of Long Beach. That's where I plan to call home, the north side of Long Beach. Why? Because it's the only place that I can afford to live in. But it's also a very beautiful neighborhood that a lot of people like to criminalize. And I like to highlight that piece, right? Because that's where communities of color are at now. They used to live in this area, but they were displaced. And who are the communities that are displaced the most? Communities of color, gentrification, 
right? That is happening all around. And we call for the defunding of the police and the way that the police is entangled with the politicians. But also, the real estate investors are in bed with the politicians. For the Lieutenant Governor 2026, right, we have the LPPOA donating 7,800. But we also have Waterford. Waterford is uh, someone who bought the Wells Fargo building. And it was in the Long Beach Business Journal that they purchased that for 105 million. So you tell me that these companies have 105 million to purchase more, purchase more property but don't have enough money to give uh, rental uh, relocation assistance to the companies that they're kicking out. Also, we know that Beachfront Property Management Company has also donated the max amount to Lieutenant Governor's um, Mayor of Garcia's uh, 2026 run, which is 7,800. That's Waterford as well, and the LPPOA. So defund the police, get the retail, the rental investors out of here, right? And let's fight for our city, right? Right to council and also a housing borough. That's what we're asking for in the people's budget of Long Beach. Thank you so much, Maria and Beto. Please, please welcome Idis Rodriguez to speak about the need for universal legal representation for immigrants. Woo! Hola, muy buenos días a todos. Mi nombre es Idis. Soy residente de Long Beach y resido en el Distrito 1. Me gustaría que supieran por qué es tan importante para mí que renueven de marzo. Estuvo en el centro de detención de adelanto durante tres largos meses y medio. Hasta ayer fue liberado. Gracias al apoyo de la comunidad, mientras estaba detenido, entré en una etapa de angustia, desesperación, miedo y estrés por no saber qué hacer. Al llamar a las puertas y hacer llamadas, Encontré la Coalición de Derechos de Inmigrantes de Long Beach, la Coalición de Santuario de Long Beach y el Fondo de, Fo de Bonos de Liberación de Long Beach, que ellos me conectaron con el Fondo de Justicia de Long Beach. A través del Fondo de Justicia de Long Beach, mi esposo Nicolás pudo tener representación legal gratuita mientras estaba en adelanto en medio de la pandemia del COVID-19. Estamos viviendo en un tiempo sin precedentes e imprescindible. En este momento requiere que nos unamos y garanticemos la salud y la seguridad de todos en nuestras comunidades, especialmente los más vulnerables como nosotros. Incluso en circunstancias normales, la detención de inmigrantes es cruel y mi esposo puede dar fe de ello aquí presente. Ahora, con COVID-19, extendiéndose rápidamente en los centros de detención. La detención de inmigrantes puede convertirse en una sentencia de muerte para muchos. A partir de mayo 26, ICE informó a 1,312 casos confirmados, aunque es probable que esto no sea un recuento insuficiente. El 52% de los que ICE ha evaluado han sido confirmados como positivos. A medida que se extiende COVID-19, nuestro gobierno es responsable de garantizar que todos en el país tengan el mismo acceso a la atención que se necesita. Es responsabilidad del gobierno usar nuestros dólares de impuestos para proteger los derechos fundamentales, la salud y la seguridad de todos en nuestras comunidades, especialmente los más vulnerables de nuestra sociedad que se ven desproporcionadamente afectados por COVID-19. Lo que está en juego para las personas de detención de inmigrantes no podría ser mayor. Ya nos enfrentamos a la amenaza de una separación permanente de nuestras familias y comunidades y al temor de ser obligados a, re a regresar a condiciones peligrosas o violentas en otro país. Los inmigrantes que, se que enfrentan deportación no tienen derecho a un abogado si no pueden pagar uno. Esto incluye a niños que, como los adultos, deben navegar por leyes complejas, reunir pruebas y llamar a testigos por su propia cuenta. Nicolás tuvo la suerte de ser beneficiado por el Fondo de Justicia de Long Beach, 
y, y debido a eso, Nicolás ahora está en casa con nosotros mientras continuamos luchando por su caso. El Fondo de Justicia de Long Beach ha salvado a nuestra familia. Les ruego que por favor renueven el Fondo de Justicia, entre otros, para que otras familias como la mía puedan beneficiarse, porque yo sola, sin dinero y sin trabajo, Ah, para poder pagar un abogado no habría sabido qué hacer no tener trabajo y no tener dinero para un abogado es muy enloquecedor espero que por favor consideren mi humilde solicitud para que la comunidad se beneficie de estos recursos como mi familia y yo lo hemos hecho de antemano les agradezco muchísimo Dios los bendiga y que tengan excelente día My name is Gabby Hernandez. I'm the Associate Director of the Long Beach Omega Rights Coalition. I'm also undocumented and very fucking tired. <laughs> but I'm here to translate for Iris and Nicolás that are here today. Y'all don't know how much we were to get Nicolás out of detention. And now he's here with us today. <laughs> Hi, good morning. My name is Iris. I'm a resident of Long Beach and reside in District 1. I would like you to know that it's very important to renew the Long Beach Justice Fund. My husband, Nicolás, was detained by ICE in early March. He was in Adelanto Detention Center for, for three very long months until yesterday. While he was detained, I entered a stage of anguish and despair, fear and stress of not knowing what to do. In knocking doors and making calls, I found the Long Beach Human Rights Coalition, Long Beach Sanctuary Coalition, and the Long Beach Liberation Bond Fund, who connected me to the Long Beach Justice Fund. Through the, launch, through the Long Beach Justice Fund, my husband was able to have free legal representation while in Adelanto in the midst of COVID-19. We are living in unprecedented and unpredictable times. This moment calls for us to come together and ensure the health and safety of everyone in our communities, especially the most vulnerable, like us. Even under normal circumstances, immigration detention is cruel, and my husband can attest to that. Now, with COVID-19 rapidly spreading in detention centers, immigration detention may become a death sentence for many. As of May 26, I reported 1,312 confirmed cases. Although this is likely to be under count, 52% of those that I have tested um, have, been, have been confirmed as a test positive. As COVID-19 spreads, our government is responsible for ensuring that everyone in the country has equal access to care, to the care that they need. It is the government's responsibility to use our tax dollars to protect the fundamental rights, health, and security of everyone in our communities, especially the most vulnerable of our society who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The stakes for people in immigration detention could not be higher. We are already facing the threat of permanent separation from our families and communities in fear of being forced to return to dangerous or violent conditions in another country. Immigration, immigrants facing deportation do not have the right to a lawyer, even if they can't afford one. This includes children who, like adults, must navigate complex law, gather evidence, and call witness to, on their own. Nicolás was fortunate enough to benefit from the Long Beach Justice Fund, and because of that, Nicolás is not home and with us as we continue to fight for his case. Woo! The Long Beach Justice Fund has saved our family. I beg you to please renew the Long Beach Justice Fund so that our family, so that other families like mine can benefit. Because I, I, I alone and without money would not have known what to do. Not having a job and not having money for a lawyer is very upsetting. I hope that you will consider my humble request for the community for the community to enjoy these benefits as my family and I have. Thank you in advance. God bless you and thank you. Thank you so much, Idis. Next, please welcome Karen Reside with the Long Beach Gray Panthers. Thank you everyone for being here this morning. I'm gonna talk on behalf of our seniors and give you a little perspective on how our city allocates its budget. 
Uh, in the city budget, senior activities are funded in the parks and recreation pro programs. And they've either been flat or have had decreases for like the last six years in funding. The city funds senior programs at 1.7 million in this current year's budget. They fund youth programs at 1.4 million dollars. They fund animal care services, which is also part of the park programs, at $5 million. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm worth more than a dog or a cat, even though I love my cat dearly. This is, these are the priorities that are totally screwed up. The stories you just heard, they can be repeated multiple times, and there's even more horrific stories. Government is not supposed to separate our families. It's not supposed to penalize people for trying to, to work and go to school and to feed their families and find decent housing. Government is supposed to protect and help us. With these priorities, it's totally screwed up. We need to work hard to change these priorities. We all want the same things for our families and for our community. We want a healthy, safe environment. One of the programs that the city is committed to is Livable Communities by AARP. What that does is it examines city infrastructure, city transportation systems, city's parks, and green space, which we don't have enough of, particularly in low-income areas, and analyzes what we can do to improve the conditions and engages the community members in uh, recommending changes to the city government. People need to make these decisions, not city employees that don't necessarily live in our community. We are too influenced by people outside the community. We still can't get figures on how many landlords own property that are subject to increasing rents. And finally, we've got the brakes put on rent prices. Seniors are being most impacted by the increases in rents, along with students from Cal State Long Beach, Long Beach City College. Students are living in their cars. Seniors are forced out of their housing. When you're getting the average of $1,400 in Social Security like I do, it's really hard to afford rent in Long Beach. It takes your whole check. You're forced to live with another person or in less than desirable living conditions. A number of seniors sleep on couches in shared housing with their families. Housing is way overcrowded. These are the things that we need to work to get changed in this year's budget. Yes, we're going to be under great stresses, but we're at a time of great change. Let's do it now. Thank you so much. sobre mi lengua y mis raíces. Mi nombre es Dora, soy miembro de la comunidad del norte de Long Beach, vivo en el Distrito 9. Amo esta ciudad, pues aquí he vivido por muchos años. Soy una persona que le gusta aprender y compartir. Hace algún tiempo nació en mí la inquietud de involucrarme en las decisiones que tuvieran que ver con mi comunidad. Participando en reuniones en el City Hall, me daba frustración por no poder comunicarme en mi lengua materna, lo cual me limitaba para poder expresar mi opinión, inquietud y necesidades. Busqué y encontré organizaciones que abogaban por los derechos de los inmigrantes. Ellos también tienen una lucha antigua y constante sobre la falta de apoyo de nuestro gobierno a la seriedad de acompañar a los residentes de sus distritos 
a ejercer su derecho de expresión en su propio idioma. Al no poder comunicarme con el alcalde y los miembros del concilio, me siento excluida de las decisiones que se toman en la ciudad donde yo vivo y a la cual pertenezco. Considero que la comunicación entre mis representantes de distrito es primordial. Primero, porque ellos trabajan para que nuestras comunidades sean atendidas. Por eso estamos aquí, pidiendo que la ciudad dedique suficiente personal para implementar completamente la política de acceso al idioma. Tener servicios internos permanentes de interpretación y traducción para proveer interpretación y traducción más rápida y de más alta calidad. Proveer interpretación en español y en Camay sin aviso previo en toda reunión del Consejo Municipal. Más ahora que estamos viviendo en tiempos difíciles, es necesario más que nunca la buena comunicación, la inclusión de las razas, el promover el sentido de pertenencia como un regalo de justicia y a la igualdad. Seguiré adelante luchando en coalición por el acceso al idioma materno en esta ciudad tan diversa a la que considero mi hogar. Muchas gracias por su atención. Who loves Dora's energy? translating for her. My language, my roots. Good morning, my name is Dora. I am a member of the North Long Beach community and I live in District 9. I love this city because I have lived here for many years. I am a person who likes to learn and share. Some time ago, a concerning me was born to get involved in decisions that had to do with my community, like participating in the city hall meetings. But I was frustrated by not being able to communicate in my mother language which limited me to be able to express my opinions, concerns, and needs. I searched and found organizations that advocate for immigrant rights. They also have a long-standing and constant fight over the lack of support from our government and are serious about accompanying residents to their districts to exercise their right of expression in their own language. By not being able to communicate with the mayor and the members of the council, I feel excluded from the decisions that are being made in the city where I live and which I belong. I consider the communication between my district representatives is essential. First, because they work so that our demands and needs are met and resolved in our communities. Second, because they represent us. This is, that is why we are here demanding that the city dedicates adequate staff to implement the, city, the city's language access policy in full, consistently, throughout the city, and finally, Create a culture of language justice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Permanently move interpretation and translation services in-house to provide faster and higher quality interpretation and translation. It's not that hard. That's right. Provide Spanish, Kamai, and Tagalog interpretation without advance requests at all city council meetings. Provide community, provide community organizations who work with limited English proficiency residents ongoing stipends to conduct outreach about the policy. In today's difficult times, good communication and racial inclusion is necessary, now more than ever, to promote a sense of belonging as a gift to justice and equality. I will keep going, fighting in coalition for language access in this city so diverse, and the one I consider my home. Thank you. Thank you, Dora, and to all our amazing speakers today for sharing your stories and speaking on the significance and importance of people's budgets. 
The city's budget is a moral document that reflects our city's values and priorities. Adopting the people's budget is more than just a shift in the way the city has done business. It's a pathway to ending anti-blackness and structural racism in the city. Undoing historic this, this investment that has continued for generations and moving us to close to a Long Beach that is safe and healthy for all. Yes! We stand united in calling on Mayor Robert Garcia, Councilmember Mary, Mary Zendejas, Councilmember Janine Pierce, Councilmember Susie Price, Councilmember Daryl Supernaw, Councilmember Stacy Mungo, Vice Mayor D. Andrews, Councilmember Roberto Uungara, Councilmember Al Austin, Councilmember Rex Richardson, and City Manager Tom Mordecai to endorse the people's budget, divest from the police, and reinvest in black lives and communities of color. Yeah. We also call on more members of the community to stand in alliance with us and endorse people's budget by visiting lb4.org slash peoples-budget. This concludes our press conference for this morning. Speakers and representatives will now be available for interviews. Thank you all for showing up for the people. I would like to close this out in a really good chant. So when I say, just just um, repeat after me, okay guys? It is our duty to fight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not use the mic because I'm just gonna scream. Can you hear me? Yes. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our